The next important figure is King Duncan, the king who is introduced at the beginning of the play as a just and a good ruler. But Shakespeare also makes clear that Duncan is not to be considered as fully just and fully moral because any rebellion against him, for example, a rebellion staged by a person in his own kingdom, by a general in his own kingdom, one who had been loyal to him at a certain point of time, namely the Thane of Cawdor, is crushed vehemently by, of course, another, another of his general Macbeth and another of his general Vancouver. Shakespeare is saying that there are a kinsmen who are still loyal to Duncan, namely Macbeth and Banquo, and there are kinsmen who are becoming uh, rebellious against the king, namely the Thane of Cawdor. But the point is that the way in which Duncan is crushing the rebellion says that any rebellion against the king must be crushed and crushed vehemently. And any basis of a just and moral rule is always located in violence. Good rule is not equal to a peaceful rule. And in King Duncan's rule, we understand the very close relationship that peace and stability has with violence. The next important character is in, in the play is Banquo. Whom, for whom the witches predict that his successors are going to become kings. And Shakespeare presents Banquo as the moral and neutral character in this play. Therefore, and, and any kind of a character who is rebellious, who is immoral, who is violent, is are always seen in terms of Banquo. I'll, re I'll explain this. For example, when the witches are telling or, or, or are prophesying about the future kingship and they talk to both Banquo and Macbeth, both of them respond differently. We understand that Macbeth's response is full of temptation because Banquo does not, Macbeth's response is full of temptation because Banquo does not respond with that kind of temptation. It is because Banquo is morally neutral that we understand that Macbeth is therefore not neutral. Uh, in comparison to Banquo, we also have the figure of Malcolm and Donaldin, the two sons of King Duncan, who are uh, expected to succeed their father to the throne, especially Malcolm, the older son, who is the Prince of Cumberland and who towards the end of the play becomes the King of Scotland as Malcolm III. Uh, we understand that even Malcolm and Donald Bain have a certain desire for power, even though that power may be uh, rightfully theirs uh, to claim. Uh, Malcolm and Donald Bain therefore have both a desire for power which Banquo does not openly demonstrate. In Banquo, Shakespeare shows that to what extent power can be sustained in an individual who is completely morally good. And therefore, when we are considering Banquo or the role of Banquo in the play, we should keep two or three points very clear. One is that Banquo is at the moral center of the play. Secondly, it is through Banquo that we understand to what extent other characters are different from a neutral position. And third, that like Banquo, the successors of the present king is going to finally claim the throne and therefore through Banquo, Shakespeare is also hinting at a future stability of monarchy. When Shakespeare is writing this play and it's being staged in front of King James the First of England or King James the Sixth of Scotland, both being again the same person, he's almost saying to the king that even though the present is full of disruption, even though the present is full of debate, even though the present is full of violence, the future is one of stability and the future is yours. 
just like in the play banquo may have faced a lot of violence banquo may have been killed but at the end of the day banquo's successors do become the kings of scotland therefore it's almost like shakespeare paying a due respect and a due offering to his patron to his king that your future is secure even though your present may not be so the next important characters or a group of characters in the play are the three witches uh, they are called the weird sisters uh, deriving from the, the the word weird is derived from the anglo-saxon word wyard w y r d which means fate and therefore the three witches are the voices of fate in this play it's also important to remember that the creation of the witches as old women who are representing fate again it wasn't an idea which shakespeare himself invented it was something which the 8th century bc greek poet hesiod did much earlier and but what shakespeare is doing is that he's creating in these three witches figures who are not entirely male who are not entirely female who are both voices of fate who are at the same time voices of individual temptation so shakespeare creates in these witches figures who are figures of confusion figures of blurred boundaries figures to use a word very contemporary and very known in shakespeare's time figures of equivocation equivocation means to say one thing and to mean another it's about dual ended meanings it's about double meanings uttered very consciously the witches are figures of equivocation they are figures of blurred boundaries because in a world where violence and non violence is one at the same thing in a world where peace and and disruption occurs together it's very difficult for fate to remain something abstract it's rooted in individual temptation but does not always remain so most importantly it's also uh, useful to remember that many critics have called lady macbeth the fourth witch of the play she is not and in fact there is a person who may be called the fourth witch of the play her name is hecate who is the mistress of the witches and it is she who is to be considered the fourth witch in the play to what extent lady macbeth at all is a witch or to what extent lady macbeth at all may be related to the weird sisters is a matter of debate which we'll take up in our later lessons the next important character to remember is macduff the important foil of uh, macbeth as a ruler because in macduff we do not have a desire for power nor do we have a completely moral figure but we have someone who is able to look for power only if he can deal with it in a responsible manner because in macduff we see power and responsibility together and therefore he is one of the important foil characters to macbeth and when we consider uh, this play as a commentary on kingship just like we take into account macbeth's usurpation just like we take into account uh, macbeth's usurpation of the position of kingship and banquo's moral neutrality with regard to kingship we also must deal with macduff's power and responsibility of kingship the other figures who are related to the position of the king and kingship the english king in macbeth is edward the confessor who was the first to practice healing of his citizens in william shakespeare's play macbeth the scottish usurper is compared and contrasted with the with his english counterpart and malcolm and macduff discuss that even a king can practice merac- miraculous deeds instead of uprooting and destabilizing his whole kingdom 